Good afternoon. Could I just make one housekeeping request before we start? Uh, if you could save questions till the end of the talk and put your hand up and wait for the mic, please. Now, I'd like to introduce Mr. Benno Lo Leslie, who's going to, to give us our next lecture. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming along this afternoon. So before I get started, um, hands up, who has heard of export control before? Okay, a lot of you. Okay, who feels that they know something about, about it? Not so many. Has anyone actually needed to uh, get their technology assessed by the Department of Defense? One, two, a few. Has anyone needed to get licenses for their technology to export? Okay, a couple. So hopefully uh, by the end of this talk, everyone will be able to say they have some idea of uh, what export control is and uh, you know, know if they need to apply it. Before I get started, I really have to mention that I'm not a lawyer. Um, so please don't take anything that I say today in any way to be legal advice. Um, if after having learning something today, you feel that the stuff you're doing may need legal advice, I suggest talking to a lawyer, not me. Um, I'm a software engineer. Uh, I've worked on a wide variety of different projects from inventory control, point of sales, medical implants, digital audio networking, build systems, Android, testing frameworks, microkernels, and real-time operating systems. Uh, in recent years, a lot of the projects that I've worked on uh, have had high reliability or security requirements to them, and as a result of that, they've needed some form of cryptography in there, and part of that sort of led me to uh, needing to find out for my own projects a little bit about the export control regime we have here in Australia. Um, although I've participated in some of the industry consultation around the, expert, uh, the export control, um, I don't necessarily consider myself an expert in this. My goal today really is to raise some awareness for people uh, and hopefully in doing so, I'll be able to demystify it a little bit, make it more approachable as, as a subject for those that need to or want to learn more about it. And my second goal today is really to make people aware of what resources are available and you can use if uh, you think that your technology may be something that is uh, controlled. So hopefully everyone was able to make the keynote yesterday. Uh, there was a couple of quotes that really stood out and, and are kind of relevant here. Uh, firstly, there's this idea that uh, in the technical world, we don't, uh, we're not in some parallel world. Uh, and whether we like it or not, the export control regime is, is really a good example of this. Um, we have to abide by and, and work within the overall uh, uh, rules here. And the second was this idea that there's a difference between what ought to be and what is. Um, and I'm sure there's some people in here who are not necessarily favorably disposed to the idea of export control, especially as it applies to, to software. Um, this talk, though, is really going to be about dealing with the, the what is. Um, I'm not really going to be talking about whether export control is good, whether export control on software is effective. Um, there's nothing wrong with having those discussions, uh, but that's not kind of what I'm trying to do today. Uh, hopefully, if you do want to have those discussions, though, uh, some of what I present today will give you an informed basis to, to uh, think about that. Uh, I've got a lot of footnotes in the later slides that uh, point to uh, the original sources where possible, so if you are interested, you can go and follow them up. Uh, you're not likely to necessarily be able to read them on the slide, but you can uh, get the slides after the presentation to, to follow, follow it up. 
Now, if you happen to be watching this on video six months from now, I've got to point out that it's February 2016 now. What I'm presenting today is, to the best of my knowledge, accurate for now. Uh, but like everything in life, export control regimes change. So things are probably different uh, if you're you know, watching this uh, sometime from now. So export control is kind of inherently an international thing. If we didn't have borders, we wouldn't really have exports and there'd be no need for export control. And while cross-border trade is a nearly universal thing uh, and export control is probably also uh, universal, the, the specifics of it are very much uh, jurisdiction specific uh, thing. So who here is from Australia? Okay, most of, of the audience. So the, the presentation I'm giving today is very much focused on Australia's export control regime. So for international guests, this is probably not directly relevant to you. Of course, you're, if you're in here now, you're in Australia. So to that extent, they do kind of apply directly. Um, although this is an Australian focus today, uh, Australia's export control regime is not that dissimilar to what you would find in other jurisdictions as well. And as we'll see later on, a lot of what's in Australia's export control regime is strongly influenced by the international multilateral agreements that Australia has entered into and which many other countries have also entered into. So when you first start looking at export control, it's kind of this complex tangle of overlapping laws and regulations. And there are many different uh, ways we could uh, approach this, this topic. There's, there's many different pieces of legislation and, and regulation that we could start with. There's many different international treaties that we're a part of that we could start with. And there's many different government agencies that uh, impact uh, export control in general. Uh, untangling all of these can be uh, a little challenging. Today, what I want to do is kind of start with a top-down approach and then kind of filter and narrow it down to the stuff that matters to uh, software developers in general. So to start with, we've got the Australia Border Force, and that's really the government agency tasked with border protection and national security duties, and it's part of the Department of Immigration and Border Control. Until not so long ago, it was known as the Australian Customs and Border Protection Service. Um, so if you end up looking at documents, don't be surprised if you see that as the title on the document rather than their new name. So the border force is there to ensure that all the goods being exported from Australia are reported as required. They're also there to administer the controls on behalf of other agencies within the government. And they also perform an information gathering uh, service as well. For our um, purposes today, it's uh, the second of these roles that uh, concerns us, how, how they administer the various controls uh, on behalf of the other agencies. So the Border Force publishes a pretty weighty manual called the Export Control Manual, and that goes into a lot of detail in what you need to do if you want to export goods from Australia. And part of it that we're kind of interested in today is uh, in Division 4 of the manual, um, and it gives us a bit of a roadmap into the various bits of legislation that uh, kind of impact uh, export control within Australia. So there's two main places where export control law, I guess, derives from. The first is the Customs Act of 1901, uh, and it's Section 112, which uh, details what prohibited exports are, and that's kind of backed up by some regulations, 
Customs Prohibited Exports Regulations of 1958. Um, if you're worried about those dates, that's just when the acts were originally put into force. They've been amended and updated many, many times since then. Now, ideally, we'd have a fairly straightforward, simple uh, thing where anything to do with export control was, was in these two regulations. Um, unfortunately, it's not that simple because there's another uh, whole set of uh, about a dozen other acts that uh, can impact uh, export control within uh, Australia. I guess if, if we had uh, lawmakers who are software engineers, they probably would have refactored this by now, but that's not quite how passing of legislation works as such. Um, one thing to note is that there's kind of two different classes of things defined in the export control. There's, there's goods which are restricted and goods that are prohibited. Uh, the difference in the category here is that restricted goods, you can get permission to export. They're not an outright ban, but you need to get some form of permit. Prohibited goods, on the other hand, you just can't export. Most things are in that first, first category. Uh, so without further ado, here's some of the goods that have uh, restricted or prohibited out of Australia. I'm not going to read all of those, but just a sample of them. Objectionable material, pornography mostly, drugs and precursor substances, rough diamonds, counterfeit credit cards, goods advocating terrorism. Uh, there's a whole uh, schedule on ozone depleting substances. Radioactive waste, uh, not surprisingly, makes the list and is a bit of a problem for us in Australia. Uh, human substances. You probably don't want to delve too much into the details there. Uh, viable material for human embryo clones seems to be of concern for the government, so that's on the list. Uh, devices and documents relating to suicide, asbestos, toothfish, um, and my favourite, cat and dog fur, which I didn't realise was a big problem until uh, kind of going into detail on this. Um, so we've got a lot of different jurisdictions, there's clearly a lot of different goods. Uh, just to round out the complexity that we've got to worry about here, there's also a dozen or so different agencies that are responsible for uh, issuing the permits and licenses that you need when you're exporting restricted goods. Now, thankfully, most of this is not directly relevant to us as software developers, but I wanted to just start by giving you a bit of a context for the overall scope of uh, export control uh, in, in Australia. And of course, when you're speaking with different people, you might say export control and you're talking about the, the very narrow thing we're going to go into, and that may mean something completely different to someone working in a different industry. Um, so how do we go about narrowing this uh, focus down to something that's actually useful to us? There's, there's sort of two main categories that, that might apply. The first is this objectionable material. If you're working in interactive media or that kind of thing, you might get tripped up there, in which case that's kind of under the Attorney General's uh, department. That's not going to be the... I don't think that's really what anyone in this room probably will get caught under. Um, but, uh, and it's not really going to be the focus of, of today's uh, discussion. For us, the main part of a export control regime that's going to impact us is uh, the, the controls which fall under Regulation 13E, uh, which basically says there's a defence and strategic good defence and strategic goods list which lists out all the uh, items that, that are important from a defence and strategy point of view from the government, and that's managed by the Defence Export Controls, which is under the Department of Defence. Uh, and because technologists are only second to the military in their love of acronyms, these are more often referred to the DSGL and DEC. So, DSGL. This is a big list of all the military and dual-use goods uh, and technologies that come under export control. Um, we're going to go into a little bit more detail what's in them later, but one thing that's 
kind of important to understand about this list is Australia, the Department of Defence, the, our politicians didn't just come up with this list themselves. Uh, what falls on this list is really a compilation of the goods and technologies that appear on the different control lists of various multilateral non-proliferation regimes that Australia is a party to. And there's four main ones. The first is the missile technology control regime, which is effectively there to limit uh, missiles, in particular uh, ones capable of nuclear, uh, carrying nuclear payloads. There's also the Australia Group, uh, which their goal is to uh, minimise the diversion risk of dual-use chemicals that could be used in chemical and biological weapons. Uh, the nuclear suppliers good is obviously uh, group is around keeping uh, nuclear trade from uh, basically reducing the risk of nuclear proliferation. And the final one is the Vasana arrangement. And this is where this basically covers conventional arms and also dual-use goods and technologies. Uh, and it's really this Vasana agreement that really impacts us. So the Vasana agreement was formed in 1996 in the aftermath of the Cold War. Uh, it replaced an earlier uh, export control regime called COCOM, which was really about focused on you know, keeping relevant goods from uh, Russia, I guess, and the former Soviet Union. That was no longer relevant after the end of the Cold War, so, so this uh, new Vasana agreement really was an update to that to reflect the current uh, geopolitics. So the Vasana arrangement comprises 41 different uh, countries, and the goal there that they have is to affect... Uh, come up with consistent policies and control lists for export control. Um, it's important to realise the Vasana arrangement does not directly affect export control laws of the participating states. Each individual state has to uh, pass their own local laws and regulations uh, with the idea of implementing what's recommended from, from the Vasana arrangements. We'll see why that's important a little later. Um, so in practice, our Australian uh, DGSL list is very similar to the list that's published by the Vasana arrangement. And in practice, when the Vasana arrangement updates its list, the Australian DGSL list uh, gets updated too. So back to the DGSL. There's two parts to it. Part one is known as the munitions list, sometimes the military list. This is really, you know, goods specifically designed for military purpose, goods that people use in war, howitzers, tanks, ammunition, chemical warfare agents, all those kind of things. Um, most, there is, however, uh, one section there that, that covers software, ML21. Uh, the software that's covered under that uh, item is really software that's somehow related to the guns, the tanks, the missiles, the rest of the things that are on, on this list. Um, it also, the only sort of pure software thing that's covered there is, uh, well the main one is uh, simulation software. So if you happen to be writing uh, it's also called serious game software. So if you're writing simulation software for end military use, for them to practice uh, scenarios, etc., that's something that's going to fall under this uh, munitions list. Now, if you're developing this kind of stuff, you're probably already pretty well aware of your export control regulations. You don't sort of... Uh, wake up one day and accidentally start developing software for a missile. Uh, so we're not really going to go into detail on that today. The second part of the DGSL is uh, the, the dual use list. So this contains items that are 
normally used for civilian purposes, but may also have military uses. And it's got this uh, list of 10 categories here. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, it's interesting, they, they start at zero. That wasn't me. That's how it is in the legislation, which, cool. Um, the, the ones that uh, kind of uh, end up impacting us here is obviously the one that says computers. Uh, and also the telecommunications and information security. Uh, the people that like playing with drones and that kind of thing might need to look at the last one there, aerospace and propulsion. That does have some references to UAVs, uh, so that may, uh, may impact some people in the room. Um, now, most of these are, uh, the, the vast bulk of this is referring to, to physical, tangible goods. Um, most of those sections, though, have, have something along the lines of uh, any software that's specially designed or modified for the development, production, use of goods in this category also is controlled. Um, at this point, I really want to emphasize that determining if something is or isn't on the uh, DSCL is, is not a simple thing. There's many exceptions. There's exceptions to exceptions, and exceptions to exceptions to exceptions. Um, and even just in this supposedly simple thing, everything you see there in quotes is actually a defined term that you've got to go look up somewhere else in the list to understand exactly what they're talking about there. Um, what I want to do now is just give you a very broad overview of the things that, that, that can end up here. So, most of the categories are, are, like I said, just how software might interact with these, these physical, tangible goods. But there's two sections that are kind of software only to some extent. The first is 4D004, which relates to software specifically designed or modified for generation, operation, or delivery of, or communication with intrusion software. Um, and intrusion software is another term in quotes, so we need to go back. If you are think that you're doing something in that area, you probably want to check out exactly what is defined as intrusion software. Um, the second uh, category there is 5A002 and 5D002, and this is the category that refers to cryptography, cryptanalysis, and also any software that's uh, certified to common criteria EAL6 level. Um, again, I really want to stress there's a lot of devil in the detail here. Um, these sections don't mean that all cryptography is controlled as such. Um, there's a lot of important things that we need to kind of have a look at before we get too worried. So most of the time, if you're... Uh, Probably most of you here aren't actually exporting goods that often, and, and you kind of don't do that accidentally most of the time. Uh, there's kind of too much paperwork that you'd need to, to fill out by customs agents and shipping uh, people. But has anyone here ever gone on a plane to fly out of Australia? Yeah, uh, a few of you. Ha has anyone ever taken their laptop with them? Yeah, um, that can be a problem. If, if you're traveling with any non-exempt uh, uh, DSL-controlled software or technology on your laptop and you take that outside of Australia, that counts as an export and you need a permit to do that. Um, I don't want everyone in the room to freak out right now, though, because it's pretty unlikely that uh, you actually have any DSL-controlled software. We're going to get into that some more. But let's say that you did. You guys are all pretty savvy software developers. Any ideas how we might avoid this and still be able to kind of share our work? Any ideas? Yeah, but I mean, even sort of before that, how do we like get s software out of the country? Yeah. Take it off your machine, put it on a web server, and SCP it from wherever you are. Yeah, so we've got this wonderful uh, invention. Uh, uh, well, it's, this is going to be clear what the answer is. So, uh, we've got this uh, pretty ubiquitous global network that lets us transfer information 
without needing to physically cross any borders. Um, probably get into some detailed arguments as whether sending a signal is crossing a border, but I'm not really a physicist. In any case, from the point of view of the export control regime, using the internet to transfer information is not classified as an export. Stupid. <laughs> okay, but these people aren't stupid. <laughs> um, this, this isn't exactly a loophole that went unnoticed. Um, in 2006, the Vasana arrangement, and the Vasana arrangement is basically groups of diplomats coming together and, and so people from, like we saw, 41 different countries, so things move slowly. So if they were kind of passing this in 2006, they were surely thinking about it earlier. In any case, in 2006, they published a best practices document that provided guidelines on how participating states should go about controlling intangible transfers of technology. Um, intangible, such as putting it up on the internet and transferring it via the internet. Um, now, earlier I mentioned that it's kind of up to each participating state to kind of enact these uh, best practices in legislation. For Australia, uh, that happened in 2012 when the Defence Trade Controls Act uh, became law. Now, this act has a lot of different purposes. Some of it's US-Australia defence agreements. Uh, there's a whole bunch in it about uh, how controlling the brokering of arms. Uh, but from our point of view, this introduced two big things that, that really affect us. Uh, the first is it introduce an offence to supply DSGL technology. Now here, supply is different from export, but this uh, effectively means make it available to someone not in Australia. Be that via the internet, be that via fax, uh, be that over the telephone. Um, it also um, means uh, providing uh, supply can also encompass uh, providing access, so you can't just uh, put it on a server in Australia, give someone else a password to it and say, well, I didn't give them, I didn't supply it to them, they got it themselves. That kind of doesn't get around uh, the uh, intent or letter of, of uh, what they put in place. The, the other one was uh, 14A, called Publishing Etc. DSGL Technology, which basically made it an offence to publish any DSGL technology, uh, and technology includes software in, in uh, explicitly includes software in this case. Um, to publish that without a permit was, was also an offence. Um, now, what exactly does publish mean? Well, the phrase that's used in a lot of the documentation is made available in the public domain. Now, uh, we're at an open source conference, there's a lot of interest in copyright and licenses, so you might think you know what the public domain means. Um, you don't. In this context, public domain has nothing to do with copyright or anything to do with price or anything to do about licenses or ownership of the technology. Here it really just means making it available with any, without any access restrictions, making it available to the public without any access restrictions. Um, and again, in this context, the, the uh, need to pay for it is not considered an access restriction. Um, and this is really the key, key difference between uh, supply on one hand, which is not made available to the public, but some select people, and publication, which is made available to the public. Now, there was, uh, people got a little bit upset about this as you can probably imagine, uh, when supply includes uh, talking to someone um, and it includes everything on both the munitions list and the dual use list and things we might be interested in like cryptography and those kind of things are on it. Uh, there's a real kind of concern from both industry and academia that, you know, simply talking to a colleague uh, internationally about some crypto could put you in vi violation of this. So a lot of people got upset and there was a lot of, I guess, uh, lobbying. The good thing about the original 2012 Act was that none of the offence provisions that I just talked about uh, came into effect until uh, 16th of May 2015. And lo and behold, before the 16th of May 2015, there was the Defence Trade Controls 
Amendment Act of 2015 that came in into place in April, um, so some just-in-time legislation there, um, that really took into account at least some of the concerns that were raised by, uh, by industry and, and academia. Uh, this act amends the original act in a few key ways. Uh, the first one is that it gave us a new deadline before these things came into place, which is April 2nd this year. So we've got another two months to uh, make yourself compliant if you feel that anything here uh, might, might affect you. Um, in addition to this, there was, there was a couple of uh, changes that were made. Firstly, uh, oral supply, as it's called, uh, so having a telephone conversation is not going to get you into to trouble. Um, of course, there's an exception to this exception. Um, you, you still can't verbally tell someone the password and username to an SFTP server and say, well, it was just oral supply. That doesn't, doesn't cut it. And uh, like many of these things, there's an exception for if it's to do with military end-use stuff or if you have any reason to believe that what you're talking about could end up in a weapons of mass destruction program. Um, those last two trump just about everything all the time. Um, hopefully none of you are in that situation. Um, there was also a pretty big change to the publication um, offence thing. It was now limited to... Uh, the offence is limited to publication of... Uh, part one of the DSGL, so the munitions part. Anything in part two, which is where crypto, etc., is 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 not regulated from a publication point of view. And of course, here again, there's backstops. If the Minister of Defence reasonably believes that a publication would prejudice the security, defence, or international relations of Australia, he can step in and say uh, no. But for the most part, uh, the publication is aspect is fine. Uh, this makes it a pretty good, strong incentive to, like someone mentioned before, uh, make things available open source and, and actually publish them widely rather than uh, just be dealing with, uh, you know, one or two other people in a different country, which would get you under the supply side of things, which has not been watered down in this 2015 amendment. Um, there's, there's one aspect of this publication uh, opening up that got people concerned, though. If, if you're, uh, I guess, an academic and you're working on a paper, there's a lot of pre-publication activity that needs to happen. You need to get reviews, you need to get feedback. If you're an open source developer, you want people to do code reviews and, and that kind of thing. And normally, that would be a supply activity and hence restricted, but they did carve out another exemption for pre-publication activity. So if you're doing some supply stuff, just sharing with one or two people, and your intent is to make that artifact uh, public, then that, uh, uh, that supply activity is, is exempt. And again, there's the catch-alls that are still in place. Don't be talking with people who are Developing a weapons of mass destruction program, you won't make any friends here. Uh, the same thing with the military, military end use stuff. So if we get back to that uh, first example, if you're traveling, you happen to be doing some new crypto algorithm uh, that is controlled, um, you, you still can't travel with that on your laptop. That would still be export. But what you can do, you can put it up into the cloud or a server as we like to call it, you know, five years ago before the cloud was a thing. Um, and then you can access that when you're in a different country. And that doesn't count as supply because you can't supply to yourself. It would still be a problem, though, if you gave someone else in another country the ability to, to get that. So, um, so what are the practical steps that you need to, to do if you think that something that you've been working on maybe may be covered. The, the first thing that I recommend is go to uh, the Department of Export, the Defense Export Controls uh, website, just that one there. There's a lot of uh, resources there for you. You might need to do a bit of digging to find it. It's not perfectly laid out, but there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, 
Sorry? Yeah, that's why I'm presenting and I'm going to get there. Um, so if you suspect you're working on dual-use software, there are, there are two different things you need to consider. One is what you're doing, which is the activity, and the other is the technology that you're working on. Uh, the, the first one is usually easier to, to work out than, than the second. So. Um, I really recommend starting with the activity and working out whether what you're doing would even be covered, because uh, that's a lot easier to do than working out whether the technology you're working on is on the list. And uh, like was pointed out, the uh, DEC website has an activity assessment questionnaire, which has basically boiled down all the complexity and all the, the different acts and um, Produce that, reduce that into a decision tree so you can click through, answer the various questions and know whether the activity that you're uh, doing is, is going to be controlled. The, the website also provides a search tool for searching the uh, DSCL. To be honest, I find this one less, less useful. The activity questionnaire is great. This one, uh, I I find it easier just to download the PDF and just uh, search that, that manually, but your mileage may vary, so, so certainly check that out. Um, if you find that what you're doing and your technology, you feel it is going to be covered, uh, the next step there is really, there's sort of two options. One is there's, you can apply to actually have the uh, defense export control actually assess whether your technology is, is covered. It's probably what you want to do first. If they say it's not covered, that makes life a lot easier. If they say it is covered, uh, then your next step is uh, really to apply uh, to, to be allowed for a permit to, to export. Um, I'm not going to get into any detail there. Uh, there's different regimes you can get. Uh, license for one specific use. You can get a general license. There's a lot of options there. Um, so even if you, what you're doing is covered, it's not sort of as though that's the end of the road. It just means you need to jump through another hoop if to, to do that stuff. Um, so some of you are probably feeling I've buried the lead here a little bit. Um, what about crypto? Um, Firstly, if it wasn't already clear, the use of cryptography itself is not controlled by any of this legislation. Uh, whether people put in other legislation around controlling crypto is, is another thing, but certainly in terms of export control, sending an encrypted email, making an encrypted phone call is not subject to, to any of the export control. Publication of crypto, um, you're free to, to publish any crypto stuff. Just remember some of the caveats that I mentioned earlier. Um, when we get down to supply of crypto uh, or export, that's, uh, that's where you're going to need, need a permit. But for supply at least, there are some exceptions. Obviously, if your activity is within Australia, that's not, not covered. Um, as we mentioned before, the verbal supply is, is also exempt, and the pre-publication supply is also exempt. So, uh, but if you sort of find that um, you know, you're not exempt for one of those reasons, there's a number of different exemptions for the technology itself. So firstly, if it's for your personal use, that's exempt. Uh, if the software is in the public domain, uh, that's also exempt. If uh, the software or technology is basic scientific research or the outcome of basic scientific research, that's also exempt. If the software is generally available to the public uh, via mass, uh, that's via the mass market, that's also exempt. And if the technology is being submitted for patent application, which probably is not applicable here, but maybe, um, that's also exempt. So, so really because of these uh, exemptions, we, a lot of what uh, you're doing is probably exempt. 
uh, especially if you're doing open source stuff, even commercial, standard commercial crypto, it probably falls under one of those exemptions. Standard university teaching, uh, which is mostly derived from textbooks and other academic publications, is all talking about stuff that's in the public domain. There's no real concerns there. It's when you get into proprietary, confidential, unpublished, new crypto schemes, uh, that is where all, all ones that are specifically designed for military use, that's where this kind of stuff is going to start impacting you. That's it. I've got five minutes for questions. Um, yeah, so just a question about the definition of software. Um, yep. Is it binary? Is it source code? Is it both? Is it and the verbal supply? Could I read out the source code over the phone to someone in another country, and would that be exporting? Um, so the the exact definition of software, um, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. I'm fairly sure um, it is defined in that uh, document. So uh, afterwards, we could bring it up and have a look at the exact definition. Uh, it, it's going to be covering both source code and object code, though. As to whether you can phone someone up and read it to them over the phone, I, I, I'm going to go back to my second slide. I'm not a lawyer. Um, uh, I, I would suspect that even if strictly in the letter of the law, it's probably not in the spirit of the law, and you probably get people not so uh, impressed with you. So. I'd probably say don't do that, but um, if you want to be pushing the boundaries, I'd say get a lawyer. Um, yeah, that's... I think there's a question down the front. Thank you. Um, supposing you were going overseas and you had on your laptop some soft... Oh, closer. Good. Software that was sort of possibly of interest from the export control point of view, and you deleted it, but you just did RM and all the data blocks are still there, would that be something to worry about? And if you, say, uploaded it to Dropbox, could that be considered supplying it to Dropbox unless it was encrypted or so, something? So just I'll, your layperson's opinion. Yeah, so in, in for the first question, I, I would think that if you had made the attempt to, to delete it, whether it was 100% securely deleted or not, I would be surprised if they wanted to go after you for that. If they were looking for something to go after you for, who knows. Um, in terms of the uploading it to uh, the cloud service, I, th that is something you can do even if that cloud service is not uh, necessarily in Australia. Um, using Dropbox, for example, is not considered supplying it to Dropbox uh, in and of itself. Um, obviously, I'd still recommend encrypting it and so forth, but I don't think that's required. Again, disclaimer, I'm not aware. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, uh, one up, up the back on the left. Thank you. One of the uh, exceptions you described to the to the to the general exceptions was uh, if the recipient of the supply was uh, engaging in nefarious activities like uh, uh, developing a weapons of mass destruction program. Yep. Um, does that have to be related to the supply? And if not, how are we supposed to know whether uh, clients who are governments in foreign countries are developing weapons of mass destruction or not? Um, this is one where I really probably should punt on. I'm pretty sure if you... Uh, so I haven't read in detail the Weapons of Mass Destruction Act. I'm fairly sure the wording is something along the lines of if you have reason to believe or could reasonably be known to believe or words to that effect, um, that's, that's... Certainly if you're knowingly doing it, you're going to be in trouble. If um, it was reasonable that you could know that, you're probably still in trouble, but again... Disclaimer. <laughs> it's 
One more down the front. That was a lot of detail, so I was just wondering if you could quickly summarize um, what the fields or kinds of software are where you need to be careful. I, I guess uh, if you're doing security software in general, you probably, and crypto in particular, but security stuff in general, you probably want to take a look at what you're doing. Um, and um, I guess we saw those, those 10 areas. If, if you're doing some software that's related to um, telecommunications, avionics, uh, that kind of stuff, if, if you can use your imagination and think of a way that it could end up having a military end use, you probably want to go and have a look at the list and uh, see if it's something that's possibly captured. Um, you know, some of this is, um, I, I think as software developers, we like uh, strict, very precisely defined stuff, and unfortunately that's not quite how the law works necessarily, so uh, you know, a little bit of common sense is, is kind of uh, required as, as well um, to, to think about what could, could be captured there. Um, if, if you're pushing the, if you're doing cutting edge stuff in some of those areas that, that were listed, there's a chance that it, it, it may, be, may be controlled. But it's probably not, but the, you know, uh, a lot of the things there are kind of performance-based. So if it's, you know, um, if it's telecommunications and it's capable of, uh, you know, uh, various wavelengths, various bit rates, various things like that, there's, there's thresholds that you need to, to reach for something to be uh, controlled. Unfortunately, the thresholds for cryptography are not so useful. It's like 56-bit symmetric, so that's a pretty low threshold. But there's all the other D controls there. So anyway, um, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you all for coming and listening. Um, I'm around for the rest of the conference if you've got any other questions. Um, cheers. <laughs>